the what is an NH frame model. An NH frame model is one where we have three parameters instead of two. So theta one, epsilon t minus one, theta two, epsilon t minus two, theta three, epsilon t minus three, plus epsilon t. I just know it's the actually fits the group. Oh, that's correct. So what did we do? Um, the first step is to determine if it's called very stationary. It is going to be. We know that epsilon t is normal, mean zero, varying sickness quiet. That is our underlying assumption. And they are IID. So they are not correlated at all. If I took the expectation, expectation of y t is expectation of theta one epsilon t minus one, theta two epsilon t minus two, theta three epsilon t minus three plus epsilon t. Linearity of expectation we can distribute. So theta one expectation of epsilon t minus one, theta two expectation of epsilon t minus two, theta three expectation of epsilon t minus three. Plus expectation of epsilon t. Well, there are all, all of the expectations are all zero because we have epsilon t to be zero and six quiet. If you recall, I started with the case where boy t has zero mean, uh, but in practice, if there is an underlying mean mu, we can always subtract it out. So even if this were to be mu, all that will get is a bunch of constants and it's not going to depend on t. So the expectation does not depend on the value of t. That's the condition is satisfied. The second, we want to find the correlation function. To do that of autocorrelation function. To, to, to do that, we start with the autocovariance function. Which is the covariance of yt comma yt plus h. Just the variance of y. If h is equal to zero. Yeah. So covariance of y t, I can replace it as epsilon t minus one times theta, theta two epsilon t minus two, theta three epsilon t minus three plus epsilon t. And y t plus h is theta one. Epsilon t plus h minus one, theta two, epsilon t plus h minus two, theta three, epsilon t plus h minus three, plus epsilon t plus h. So if h is equal to zero, Gallus of zero is simply the variance of y t. So that is y t. 
We're simply going to plug in H is equal to zero in all of this. So theta one, epsilon t minus one, theta two, epsilon t minus two, theta three, epsilon t minus three, cos epsilon t. And as I mentioned last time, all we care about is to look at terms that match where the time indices match. So here we've got t minus one matches with t minus one, t minus two would match with t minus two and so forth. So that times that would give you theta one squared, that times that theta two squared, theta three times theta three, theta, theta three squared. And lastly, epsilon t and epsilon t matches. So we would have covariance of epsilon t, comma, epsilon t. Oops, I made a mistake. I forgot to insert something in here. So theta one squared, Covariance of epsilon t minus one, epsilon t minus one. Theta two squared, covariance of epsilon t minus two, epsilon t minus two. Theta three squared, covariance of epsilon t minus three, epsilon t minus three. Lastly, covariance of epsilon t, common epsilon t. No, of course not. Oh. <laughs> so, what is the covariance of epsilon t minus one, epsilon t minus one? The variance. The variance of epsilon t. So, sigma squared, theta two squared, covariance of epsilon t minus two, epsilon t minus two, still theta, oops, sigma squared, theta three squared. Covariance of epsilon t minus three, epsilon t minus three, the sigma squared. Last then, sigma squared. What do we have in common? Sigma squared. Sigma squared. And if I pull that out, I will have one plus theta one squared, theta two squared, plus theta three squared. And that is the variance of an MA3 model because we are trying to evaluate at H is equal to zero. Are we good? At H is equal to one, I am going to do gamma sub zero and gamma sub one, and I'm going to try gamma sub two and gamma sub three, which I know we can do it by now. So gamma sub one would be covariance of theta one, epsilon t minus one, theta two, epsilon t minus two, theta three, epsilon t minus three, plus Epsilon t. We are looking in h is equal to one there, so we will end up having theta one epsilon t plus theta two epsilon t minus one. When we put uh, one there, theta three epsilon t minus two plus epsilon t plus one. Good. Well, we've got to look at the terms where the time indices match. Okay, where did the H's go? You, you find the one. The reason the H is in the, in the, in the other one. Oh, I see. I see. So, we want to look at terms where the time indices match. 
So T minus one there, T minus one there matches. So theta one times theta two. Covariance of epsilon t minus one, comma epsilon t minus one. The next time the index that matches would be epsilon t minus two. I've got one here, I've got one there. Theta two, theta three multiplied by covariance of epsilon t minus two, comma, epsilon t minus two. I don't see the t minus three term, so the rest would be zero. I do see an epsilon t term, and that matches the epsilon t here. And that is what it will have. So now, what's going to just be the beta one, beta two, uh, sigma square plus, yeah. Yes, I know. What do we have in common? Sigma squared. So if we pull that out. That's what we will have. Yes. Let's go ahead and find um, the order covariance when H is equal to two. So if not H is equal to two, gamma two would be covariance of y t plus y t plus two. All I'm doing is I'm going to plug in h is equal to two in my gamma h expression. Covariance of theta one, epsilon t minus one, theta two, epsilon t minus two, theta three, epsilon t minus three, epsilon t. The second part, theta one, epsilon t plus two, Minus one, I would have t plus one. Theta two, t plus two minus t, I'd get zero. T plus two minus three, I would get epsilon t minus one. And lastly, epsilon t plus two. The only time indices that would match here are the epsilon t, t and t, oh, t minus one and t minus one. Yes, so theta one, theta three, covariance epsilon t minus one, comma epsilon t minus one, plus theta. Two the variance of epsilon t, epsilon t. Yes. And we know what those two are. Those are just sigma squared. So theta one, theta three, plus theta two, sigma squared. Good. Let's go ahead and find. So, as h is equal to three, gamma three would simply be equal to covariance theta one y t minus one. Oops, epsilon t minus one, theta two epsilon t minus two, theta three epsilon t minus three plus epsilon t. And looking, h is equal to three, which would give us theta one, epsilon three minus one, it is two. 
plus theta 2, h is equal to 3, 3 minus 2 is 1, you would have epsilon t plus 1. 3 minus 3 is 0, theta 3, epsilon t. And lastly, you would have epsilon t plus 3. The only time index that is going to match would be epsilon t. Yes. So the rest they don't matter. So theta three squared covariance. Sorry, theta three times covariance of epsilon t. Epsilon t. Yes. Which would be theta three sigma squared? What about theta is equal to four or zero? So for h greater than or equal to four, gamma h is zero. Good. By the way, is gamma is gamma zero? Uh, the one that always equals one, or am I thinking of something else? The row zero is always one. Good. Let's see. So we know the autocorrelation function. Is simply row h, which would be gamma h over gamma zero. We know that gamma h for h equals one, two, three, and also four and beyond. We know the value of gamma naught. So row h is always one when h is equal to zero. Which makes sense too, right? H equals zero, gamma zero, gamma zero. Gamma zero in this case was one plus theta one squared plus theta two squared plus theta three squared. So what was gamma one? Gamma one was theta two, theta one, theta two, theta three. Am I doing this right? I get gamma one was sigma squared times theta one, theta two, plus theta two, theta three, plus theta one. And, and we just have to divide that by one plus, I just write it to simplify the notation. Why the sigma squared stop? Huh? Why the sigma squared stop? Because there are sigma squared, there's sigma squared there. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Wait, oh, that's a cancel. Out. This is J. What was the next step? Sorry, can you explain that? Is that the, that's the sigma zero, right? This one. This is sigma one, yeah. sigma four, gamma. Sorry, gamma one, which is this term multiplied by sigma squared. This is gamma zero, which is that term multiplied by sigma well, I just say this case square cancels it. Yes, uh, leaving you with this. Okay, you just didn't want to write down the whole set uh, gamma one. Right. Uh, gamma zero. Okay. What about when h is equal to two? That, that is. Um, so that would be theta one, theta three. <laughs> 
uh, plus theta squared. Divided by the same. Wait, it's going to be h equals one. Yes. Yeah. And lastly, when we have h equals three, it is just theta three, yeah. right? From here, divided by one plus some j equals one to three. Theta j is twice. Or h equals three. What happens when n value breaks the bound of three? It's zero. By the way, um, would it prefer that for, for super zero that you're divided by, would it, if, it, if we were doing a MA4 model, would it be? One plus uh, the, the four on top, I can't remember what the name of that thing is. We're getting it. So that's row H4. We're going to raise this side. Four. And the MA three more. I want you to let's say you remember for an MA1 model, when H was zero, excuse me, one, when H is zero. When it was H is equal to one, what did we have? We had one plus theta one. Or theta one, simply theta one. Over one plus theta one squared. And for any other value, it was zero. And that was that point. For an MA2 model, row H was one for h is equal to zero. It was theta one plus theta one. Theta two, theta one plus theta one. Divided by one plus theta one squared plus theta two squared. Or H is equal to one. Correct. And the last case, it was theta two, one cloud divided by one plus theta one squared, one plus theta two squared. That was for H equals two. And what happens for anything greater than two? Zero. Zero. Okay, uh, the, the denominator part is easy, right? It is just the one plus the sum of all of the teachers squared. The numerator part, if h is instead, one, instead of three, would just be the sum of j equals one to q. Yes. So when h is one, I'm starting at theta one. And I can write it as theta. Which one should I use? I'll go to that term. Theta two multiplied by or theta one multiplied by t h plus one. Um, in other words. 
hates us one. So that term, I could put it as h plus one, and that term, I could put it as h plus two. There'll be a break, wait, sorry, can you repeat that? So I can put that term as h plus one, and that as h plus two. Yes. So let's see if that works. So I'm starting at theta one plus theta one h oops theta h plus one plus theta two theta h plus two. The next term naturally would be theta three multiplied by theta h plus three. But will that recursion work for other cases? Or recursion by recursion, I mean this general term. When h is equal to one, I get theta one, theta one, theta two, theta two, theta three. Everything else would be zero because our model doesn't have theta four, theta five, and so forth. So all of that would go away. Correct. When h is equal to two, I will have theta two, theta one, theta three, theta two, theta four, zero, because we don't have theta four, all of that will go away. Yes. When h is equal to three, I would have theta three, theta one, theta four, gone, theta two, theta five, gone, because we don't have any of those. All of those go away. So it seems like that particular expression is working for us. Um, so we verified it with the MA3 case. I'm going to divide this by. One plus some I equals one to q theta i squared occurs in sigma squared will get cancelled. And before we proceed, we've got to verify if whatever we wrote works for MA1 and MA2. If it does, the chances are it is going to work for MA4, MA5, because we checked it thrice and if it you know, work for all three cases, hopefully, or it is going to work for the fourth case. So the denominator part is easy. <clears throat> Let's verify for h is equal to one. When h, excuse me, when q is equal to one, and make one more. So when h is zero, it is one. When h is equal to one, I will have theta one. Theta one multiplied by theta two. We don't have a theta two. We don't have a theta three. All of that will become zero. So I'll have theta one divided by plus. And then a zero for h greater than or equal to. So just greater than q, right? Yes. Greater than q. Sure, but greater than or equal to q plus one. Uh, um, let's say that it works out for an MA2 model. When h is zero, got one works. When h is one, I have theta one, theta one, theta one, one plus one, two. Theta one, theta two, 
theta two, theta one plus two, which is theta three, but it is an MA two model. We can't have theta three, we can't have theta four. So all of the little stands past that will be zero. So if we get that. When H is two, I get theta two. Theta one, two plus one is three. We don't have a theta three. So everything else will become zero. We simply get theta two. So it seems like that is correct. For that, I don't know if it's right. I could write zero is less than H, which is less than or equal to Q. Yeah. Uh, I'm about to generalize it and write it in the inside of all. Um, so we can write for an MAQ model, rho H is equal to one when H is equal to zero. We just got to make this fancy. Sum k equals zero to q theta k multiplied by theta k h plus. Good. We do have to mention that theta zero is one, or else it's not going to work. Right. So theta zero is one, and another restriction that we wanted but is k is less than or equal to q, which is obvious there, and h is also less than or equal. Um, do you need to divide by yes and plus? So divided by one plus some. I don't need that one, right? Since I defined theta zero is equal to one, I can simply say some k equals zero to q theta is what. Correct. I'm defining p to zero to be one. The last term in the autocorrelation function for H greater than Q. Or H greater than or equal to Q plus one, it will be zero. I'll be clear. So I mentioned we ran into loads of problems in estimating the MA1 coefficient and MA2 coefficients, typically estimating the coefficients of an MA model is difficult compared to an A model. We will talk about that next. But remember phi of Z, and then I moved it to the other side and I ended up getting psi of Z, right? And then we found the values of psi by using an expression. So an MA model 
let's say we have an MA1 mole. Before I get to that, concept of invertibility. So, for something to be invertible, if I can invert the process, then I would be able to use this technique. But if it's not invertible, I have to find other ways. Computation. So what is the condition for invertibility? So the, the characteristic for the normal feature of set must lie or must have roots that are outside the unit circle. Uh, it could be complex or real, it doesn't matter, because even in the complex plane, we know that what outside the unit circle would mean, because X axis is the real axis, and Y is the imaginary. If the real part is outside the unit circle, it really doesn't matter where the imaginary part lies. If the imaginary part is outside the unit circle, it really doesn't matter where the real part lies. So, as long as the root lies outside the unit circle or theta offset, the characteristic polynomial on the NA side, then we can invert. By the way, we usually use the, the different symbol next to so Z because when we use like a patience. <laughs> so why T is equal to Epsilon t plus theta one epsilon t minus one. So that is an MA one more model. Yes. The lag here is zero. I'll use the lag operator L and I'll have epsilon t. Correct. Epsilon T would then be sorry, it can be pulled out. So we will have Y T is equal to epsilon T multiplied by one plus H of one L. Correct. And what did we do the last time? Because we didn't like to set an operator equal to zero and solve, we change that L to exact. Good. And that is simply theta set. That is the characteristic polynomial on the right hand side. That's just an A for the circle. Yes, that's a fancy way of writing uppercase theta. One of my advisors told me that. I mean, I don't know what a way to write it. Oh, it was huh? Or was it not the hell about it? I mean, you can shorten this a bit, I guess. Right? You don't see it. Then oh, I see it now. It, it's an uppercase theta. Okay. 
So if you observe carefully, this is uppercase theta. In contrast, in previous cases, this is what we did. Fitting what said, moisty is equal to epsilon t. Correct. This is what I was talking to you about, Alex. So be patient. So no, this is the characteristic polynomial on the AR side. This is the characteristic polynomial on the MA side. Good. And you said that the uh, that's a, a capital theta. Yes. That's how I like to call it, the characteristic polynomial on the MA side, characteristic polynomial on the AR side. So, how did we find the side weights? Or the side, we just had a general formula of the table. Just take the root, not the big way, you plug in the H. Right, we had an equation, yeah. right? Equation. But how did we get that equation? We derived it. We derived it. We started here. Right, and what what did we do from this part? Like we 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 got the thetas and we put it in terms of the operator. No, we removed the operator. But it set it like we put et in a place of the operator. Okay, and then so this is the characteristic polynomial, right? We found the roots of the polynomial, correct? After we found the roots of the polynomial, what did we do? We divide it on both sides by that term. Then we use partial fractions and we got a general expression for sine. That's what the gamma we did here. We saw the gamma and then we got C. Lambda, we really lambda, we can I say, yeah, but we're going to do the exact same thing. So, in the MA1 case, so this is more like a easy approach or an ad hoc approach. So, that's my MA coefficients. So all I have to do is to move or divide by theta of Z. To the other side. We get the roots. Now you will see as to why we wanted um, that invertibility condition. Because if the roots are invertible, excuse me, if the condition is not met, the series that we will get will not converge. 
and we cannot have a convergent model. What do I mean by well, that? You can have a divergent model. Huh? You said we're not converged, which would mean a divergent model. And we've done what, uh, something that will not converge. So uh, let's just consider theta one equals point five four. So more say in terms of epsilon c it's simply be one plus point five four z yes what is it a characteristic polynomial on the ma side it is one point five four z We want a set is equal to zero and solve for the root. So set so one plus point five four z equals zero, which would imply z is equal to negative one divided by point by four and what do we get one point nine six right Negative one point eight five one. Does it lie outside the unit set? It's negative, so it's still outside the unit set, right? Yeah. I mean, when we draw the unit set, let's see if I can draw one properly. Minus one one minus one one. Still outside the unit set. So the model is invertible. No, for some reason I had a. Oh, okay. For some reason I had a misconception of the closing unit circle, it seems. Come again? For some reason I was thinking that of the unit circle in terms of highs and highs. In terms of highs. Yeah, I, I know. Dance giving a month away. It's too early to talk about height. The model is invertible. What do I mean by that? So, since the roots of the polynomial theta z lie outside the unit circle, when I do this, y t equals epsilon t and one over theta z right i simply will get one over one plus point five four z yes i can write this as a series we've done this before what is a series The summation. This is the infinite sum of a Sartre G. Geometric. It's a geometric series. And we know that it converges.
because the number attached to C is less than one. Right, that's A. So let's forget about the operand. We'll just call you know less than one because Z comes from the line operand at L. So we can ignore that. And if the infinite sum is one over one minus a, well, here it's negative 0.54, not just 0.54. Uh, that's the infinite sum of geometry series. So sum i equals zero to infinity. A raised i is simply one over one minus a. Wait, well, I give you the one min minus negative point five four. Because it is one plus point five four. And A has to be negative point five four. That's going to be so A to Z is one plus point five four. Right. What is negative times negative? It's positive. Yeah. I'm just rewriting it this way because the infinite sum of a geometric series is one over one minus A. So theta one is an equal to a. You said theta one equals positive one five four. Right, but a equal to this, right here. Oh, okay. So I can rewrite that as sum i equals zero to infinity, negative point five four set brings something. Multiplied by y t equals epsilon t. Good. Yes. Yeah. Plug in the values, I'll end up getting minus point five four set. Raise zero. Plus minus point five four set raise one minus point five four set raise two minus point five four set raise three plus dot 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 multiplied by y t equals epsilon t. First term is one. The second term minus point five four set. Third, what is negative point five four split? Point two nine two. Point two nine two set square minus. Point five four cubed negative point one five seven five plus dot dot dot. Yes. Last time we wrote y t in terms of the epsilon. This time we are writing epsilon t in terms of the size. So 
This is a beautiful boy. Before that, I'm going to be right. Set by the lag operator. Good. So we will have yt minus point five four point t minus one plus point two nine two point t minus two minus point one five eight point t minus three double dot equals epsilon t. So, on the other side, we had the sine wave. Sine one was always one. On this side, this is pi zero, pi one, pi two, pi three, dot dot dot. Those are called the pi waves. Good. M side, side waves, characteristic polynomial, theta offset. AR side, I waves, characteristic polynomial, phi offset. Good. Give me that last bit, sir. MA side, characteristic polynomial, theta offset, side waves. AR side, which is the left hand side. Characteristic polynomial is fields that you will have pi waves. Good. So we would use the pi waves to find uh, theta one, which we will do next time. <laughs>